and I shouldn't waste time, and it's not a waste of time. We're not going to talk about the prologue at all. Um, but I do need to talk real brief. I don't need to, but I want to. Uh, the forward to the second edition. First edition, if you read the textual note, the first edition's published in 54 or 55. Okay? Tolkien comes out with the second edition about 10 years later in 1965. Okay? He comes out with the second edition because he makes corrections. He corrects errors that are in the first edition. Errors that he sees, errors that he knows publishers made some changes to and such. For example, they kept wanting to change dwarves to dwarfs. And Tolkien was pretty um, adamant about, no, it needs to be D-W-A-R-V-E-S. And he did that for philological reasons. But I want a couple comments about the forward of the second edition. He tells us how this came into being, okay, first of all. He says, you know, it was begun soon after The Hobbit was writ written before its publication in 37. Hobbit was published in 37. He started writing it in 31, okay. So he tells us, he began writing this before The Hobbit even saw light of day in 1937, okay. And he did because he sees the connection... The Hobbit serves as the connection between the material from the Silmarillion, which isn't published till after his death, four years after his death, and this material, okay? When he wrote The Hobbit, The Hobbit kind of internally drew him back to some of the stories he had begun as long ago as 1916, okay, when he was 20 eight years old or so, 28, 24, something like that. So he says, you know, he didn't go on with this. This is the sequel to The Hobbit. He didn't go on with this because he wanted to go back to the other stuff, the mythological stuff about the Elder Days. That's the Silmarillion. He kept fiddling with that almost up until literally the day he died. He, he went, that's why there's a 12 volume. History of Middle Earth. These are the notes and scraps of manuscripts that become all of this. Okay? So, when he says in the second paragraph, when those whose advice and opinion I sought corrected little hope to no hope, what's the little hope to no hope about? The earlier stories, the stuff that becomes a Silmarillion. That is, he sought the advice and counsel of friends and said, well, you, you think there's any possibility? And they said, give it up, Tollers. Tollers was his nickname. He's talking about the meaning of the group, the Inklings. C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, Hugo Dyson, several others. They would meet together twice a week, either in C.S. Lewis's rooms or at one of a couple different pubs, one the Burden Baby or the Eagle and Child. And they would sit there and drink and smoke and read each other what they were working on at the time. Okay? And he had been reading to them pieces of the summary, and they said, give it up. Nobody's going to want to read that stuff. Why? Because Tolkien says it was primarily linguistic in inspiration. And it was written, the, mater the Silmarillion material, was written to provide the necessary background for the history of Elvish tongues. Tolkien, being a philologist, that's a studier of languages, Tolkien realized you don't have a language without first a culture. The culture gives rise to the language. What does the language then do? It preserves what's in the culture. It preserves the stories of that culture. So... He'd been creating languages from the late 19-teens. Literal creating languages. A book of Gnomish, for example. And he realized, well, in order for that language to be real, there has to be stuff written in it. You know, Klingon, as an example, from Star Trek. Klingon didn't, quote-unquote, become a, quote-unquote, real language and people start, until people started. And you can now read stories in Klingon. Okay, you can like read, uh, I've seen it somewhere, um, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in Klingon. <laughs> if you can read Klingon. I mean, you've got to be really weird to go out there. I had a friend in high school, mid-70s, who taught himself Elvish. And he could speak and write Elvish. And, you know, <laughs> uber nerd. I mean, you see Berkeley engineering, you know, the whole nine yards. Okay. So he says, I went back to this, the sequel. Okay. 
And as he writes this, what happens? Well, the stuff he really wants to be writing on keeps sneaking its way in. That's the Silmarillion stuff. All right? So he goes on and talks about kind of the, the, the time, the chronology of the writing of this. And says, Roman numeral 23, big long paragraph, the Lord of the Rings has been read by many people since it finally appeared in print. And he says, I want to say something about some of the criticism about it. For example, people have given all kinds of motives for why I wrote this. Here it is. This is Tolkien, the author, saying, here's why I wrote The Lord of the Rings. Prime motive was the desire of a tale teller to try his hand at a really long story. Failed or succeeded? Succeeded. Okay. I mean. It's over a thousand pages. It's a really long story. And it's small print. It's not like the Harry Potter. You know, big print, a lot of white space. Okay. So, succeeded there. Really long story. That would hold the attention of readers. Yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say it's done that since 1954. Up until a certain woman published a book beginning in 1997 that then continued with seven books until 2007, this was one of the best-selling books in history. And she kind of blew this one out of the water with her seven books. Okay, So, held the attention of readers, amused them, yeah, delight them, yeah, and maybe at times even excite or deeply move them. Now, if you're all total Harry Potter nerds, this probably hasn't been your experience. But I read this, I won't say, but not quite before J.K. Rowling was born, but she was a little girl when I first read Lord of the Rings. And at the scene where Aragorn, Legless, and Gimli are chasing after Pippin and Merry being held by the orcs, I was running right along with them. The first time... I actually got there. And when certain people died, you know, like with Dobby, tears, you know, etc. Okay? So, he says, why did I write this kind of story? It's the kind of story I like. It's pretty clear, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Now, he doesn't wait, he doesn't say, he kind of does. I was going to say, he doesn't say what Ray Bradbury says in a coda that he wrote to Fahrenheit 451, right around the year 2000-2001. And in the coda, it, it came to Bradbury's attention that certain people didn't like Fahrenheit 451 because it doesn't have a strong female lead character. It does have Clarice. Okay, she gets killed off. But. And so people wanted to rewrite Fahrenheit 451 and add some women characters. And Bradbury essentially said, hell no. It's my book. You don't like it. Write your own book. Tolkien says, Some who have read the book, comma, or at any rate have reviewed it, comma, what does he mean by that? Not reading it. They read it, they reviewed it, but didn't read it. Happens all the time, by the way. Book reviewers have found it boring, absurd, or contemptible. And he goes, and you know what? That's fine. Because that's what I think of their stuff. I don't like what they write. They don't like what I write. Cool. Okay. But apparently a lot of people like what he wrote. I mean, they've seen how many god-awful films has Peter Jackson now done from the Lord of the Rings universe? And he wants to do the Silmarillion? He didn't want Guillermo del Toro to do it. I don't want anybody to do it. I know. Because nobody can, you can't do that series of myths justice, because it's myth, right? So what Tolkien says in his essay on fairy stories, which we didn't read, literary art is best left to literature. He says, film cannot do it justice. Because what are you doing? You're not merely adapting. You are changing everything about it. Because when you read this, go on to the next page, he talks about allegory and applicability. He says, I don't like allegory. I've never really liked allegory. Why? What does allegory do? What is allegory? 
allegory is when you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between a symbol and what that symbol means. So, greatest allegory in the English language. Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Excuse me, written in the 17th century. The pilgrim in that novel is named Christian. It's an allegory. One-to-one -one correspondence. Christian never stands for or represents Jew. A Muslim or Buddhist or atheist or agnostic or anything else only represents Christians, period. And when Christian is making his way and he slips in the, you know, mire of sin, the slough of despondency, for example, despondency always and only represents despondency, depression. You never get in the slough of despondency and you're suddenly happy. Okay? And Mr. Works a lot is always only Mr. Works a lot. It's the guy who never stops, kind of a thing. Okay? That's allegory. Tolkien says, I don't like that. Why? Because that takes our reader's freedom. That's where the author says, you have to read this and you have to understand. Okay, let's say J.K. Rowling was writing allegory. And Harry Potter, the chosen one. And that she intended the chosen one to be somebody. Jesus. Where you could only read Harry as being Jesus. All the time. So you're just reading on along. And Jesus said to Hermione, and Jesus said to Ron, and Jesus got the... Okay, so what does that do? That means you're not free. That's the author's reaching down into your mind and saying, look, stupid, I'm telling you how to read this. Well, that's not fun. It changes all the other characters, too. Well, it changes everything. It, it means, rather than being a work of literature and a work of fiction, you might as well just have that person come in and tell you what to think. How many people in here like being told what to think? Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay? That's why Tolkien doesn't like that. But he says, applicability. Now, that's something different. See, because a lot of people, when they first read this, they said, oh, The Ring, I know what that is. Because of when it's published and when it's written, The Ring equals the atom bomb. He's against the atom bomb. He's a green. He's like us. He's a tree hugger. He was a tree hugger. I mean, he's the biggest tree hugger the world has ever seen, okay? But he wasn't, quote-unquote, against atom bombs. He was, actually, personally. He was an anarchist, his, his terminology. Not, you know, wanting to blow everything up. Just leave me the hell alone. Anarchy in that way. Just leave me alone. Let me have my own little, okay? Applicability, however, means what? means you can... Read something and you can see echoes of it. You can apply it to the world. So you have a war of the ring that occurs between what two great forces? East and West. Forces of the West and Sauron. Well, as he's writing this, the world is divided into, especially after the end of World War II, the Eastern Bloc nations and the Western world. Okay? That's applicability. Are there other ways to apply it? Sure there are. Does that mean that every little thing in the novel has an applicability? Does that mean that you read Gollum and he wants you to think, no. Gollum is what? Gollum is each one of us, man. Each one of us can be a Gollum. Okay? That's what's so hard for Frodo to understand. Frodo doesn't like that idea. Because we don't like thinking that we can become Gollum-like. Why do we demonize our enemies so much? Why do we make them not the Japanese, but the Japs, the Nips, the Gooks? Why do we make them not the Germans, but the Jerrys, the Krauts? It makes them a lot easier to kill. If you no longer see your enemy as human, you know, just wipe them out. Totally destroy them. Okay? So he says, you know, and there are other ways you can read it too. Now, 
One thing that he does address in the last paragraph on Roman numeral 24, he's talking about, you know, an author cannot remove him or herself from their situation, their history in writing a story. What's he mean? Experience is going to bleed in no matter what. That is, you can try to you can try to keep them out, but you can't. Why does he say that? By 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. Okay, just let that percolate for a moment. By 1918, 1918, Tolkien was see, he was born in 93, I believe, so he was 25. He had fought in World War I, all but one of his close friends. So think of all of your close friends, however that many that is. It might be three, because you're like me and don't have many close friends. Or you might be one of those, you know, social butterflies, and you've got a hundred best friends. Kill them all but one. That is, remove every one of them. Not remove, they moved away. They're gone. They're dead. How does that affect you? By the time you're 25. What kind of outlook on life do you have after that? What kind of outlook on life do you have after you fought in the song? Where you literally, as we are going to see here, crawl over decapitated bodies. And crawl through marshy land, through puddles, where you see decapitated heads looking up at you. Those aren't the kinds of things you easily get over, okay? He says, or well, let's take another matter, the scouring of the Shire. Some say that that reflects the situation at the time when I was finishing my tale. Finishing! Well, when was he finishing his tale? The early 1950s. He says, nope, that was foreseen from the outset. Why? Because Tolkien is wise enough to know when you leave home for a period of time and go back, what's happened? It's different. You change. It changes. You know, like we were saying the other, I think it was this class, I get them all mixed up. You read this book now, maybe some of you will pick it up again in 20 years and read it. Guess what's going to happen probably? I mean, I told you, read Silmarillion again when you're done. You read the Silmarillion a second time, and light bulbs are going to start going off. And you read it a third time, and even more light bulbs. And then you pick up the Lord of the Rings, and it's going to be like solar flares going off in your mind. Because you're going to go, whoa, that's totally cool how we did that. And then you pick up the Hobbit and go, oh, that was pretty subtle. Okay, It's the same thing, you know, when I every time I read you know, Harry Potter stuff. I get to book six and seven, especially, and it's like, damn, she's smart. She is ingenious and tricky and sly and sneaky and conniving because she puts this little thing and you don't get it until the 80th reading kind of a thing, okay? So, we didn't read The Hobbit, but if we had read The Hobbit, some of you might have read The Hobbit. How does The Hobbit begin? Okay, that's how the... Chapter begins. What's the what's the chapter title where that begins? An unexpected journey. An unexpected party. Look at the title of this one. He's linking the two, clearly. Okay, so the unexpected party is Bilbo's fat, dumb, and happy. He likes his life, and Gandalf comes and marks up his door, invites a bunch of dwarves, and he goes off on an adventure. Here, Bilbo is also getting ready to go off on an adventure. Okay? We're going to skip a lot. A whole lot. Like, almost all of it. <laughs> okay? Page 32, if you've got the one volume edition. Bilbo and Gandalf are talking. And he tells Gandalf, you know, he's going to go through with this plan. Or you might pronounce it Gandalf. And some do. And he says, I'm old, Gandalf. I don't look at, yeah, that happens. I don't look at, 
But I'm beginning to feel in my heart of hearts, oh, well preserved indeed. I feel all, feel all thin, sort of stretched. And he uses the image, like butter that's been scraped over too much bread. Well, how old is he? He's 111. Frodo is how old? 33. Altogether, they make up 144, run gross, so he, they invite 144 people to the party, etc. So, Gandalf asks him about the, green, uh, about the ring. He says it's in an envelope. It's on the mantelpiece. We all know it's not in an envelope on the mantelpiece. It's in his pocket. Gandalf says you need to leave it here. Bilbo says some things, and then he calls it my precious. You know, and Gandalf gets a little testy, let's say. Does Gandalf threaten him? So, Bilbo says, here, you take the ring. Nope. Gandalf says, don't give the ring to me, put it on the mantle. Notice right there, I mean, we're less than 40 pages into the book, and Peter Jackson does what? Does he have Bilbo leave the ring in the envelope on the mantelpiece? No. Does this in? Gandalf takes it. Well, no! There's a problem with that. So, Frodo comes back. Gandalf says he left. One of the two most important chapters in the entire novel, Shadow of the West. It's, excuse me, Shadow of the Past. It's the second chapter of the first book. The Lord of the Rings is made up of six books. Those six books are made up in three volumes. All told, it is one novel. It is not a trilogy. Everybody calls it a trilogy. A trilogy is three separate novels that deal with a similar idea or issue or a continuing problem. These are all one novel. Tolkien, in fact, didn't want to call it The Lord of the Rings. That wasn't his original title. The original title was The War of the Ring. War of the Ring, okay? So, the shadow of, past, shadow of the Past is one of two explication chapters where we get a whole lot of back information that we need in order for any of this to make any sense. How do they t handle this in the film? Kate Blanchett narrates. And we see a bunch of stuff happening, okay? So, Gandalf goes away after the party. Years go by. He comes back every now and then. And one morning, I'm going to skip all the stuff about the green dragon with Sam and his father and Ted Sandyman and such. One morning, Gandalf comes back. Page 46. And Frodo says, you started to tell me some strange things last night, Gandalf, about my ring. And, and then you stopped because you said, you know, we should talk about this at night. How's the ring dangerous? Far more powerful than I ever dared to think of first. So powerful, notice, we're not even 50 pages in of a thousand page novel. Far more powerful than I ever dared to think of first. So powerful that in the end it would utterly overcome anyone of mortal race who possessed it. So what has... Gandalf, a.k.a. Tolkien, just told us. If you're mortal, and you try to possess the ring, it will do what? Possess you. Jump to the end. What's he showing us? What's he foreshadowing? Louder? Frodo will fail. Frodo is a failure. Frodo is a complete and total failure. He doesn't only partially fail, he completely fails. Who's the... Who completes the quest? Sam. Nope. Gollum. Gollum. It's Gollum. Yeah, Frodo gets the ring there. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Okay, so, he goes on. A mortal who keeps one of the great rings does not die, but he doesn't grow, obtain more life. He merely continues until at last every minute is weariness. If he uses the ring often to make himself invisible, what happens? Well, he becomes invisible permanently. You know, watch out, Harry. <laughs> he becomes, in the end, invisible permanently, walks in the twilight under the eye of the dark power, rules the rings, etc., etc. Okay. 
So Gandalf goes on and says, you know, ever since Bilbo left, I've been worried about you because I wouldn't want the dark power to overcome the Shire. Page 49. Well, why should he? Why should he even think about us? And Gandalf mentions two reasons. Malice. What's another word for malice? Good old normal all-American evil, you know. And revenge. Notice, Frodo doesn't deal with the malice part. Revenge? Why would he want revenge? What, what have we, what has the Shire done against him? Revenge has everything to do with it. Give me the ring, Gandalf says, for a moment. The for a moment is important. He's not saying, you know, using subliminal uh, techniques and going, Frodo, give me the ring, give me the ring, you know. Give me the ring for a moment. The for a moment means and I'll give it right back to you. Frodo does. Gandalf takes it, holds it up, says, see any marks? There's no marks. He says, okay, well, look. And throws it in Frodo's little fireplace. And Frodo, oh, my ring, you know. Notice, Gandalf reaches into the fireplace, not with his hands, with tongs. He pulls out the glowing gold ring with tongs and drops it in Frodo's hand. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd do this really fast before it drops in my hand. But Frodo doesn't. Why? It's not even hot enough to burn his hand. It's hot enough to show letter, but it's not hot enough for the metal to be hot to the touch. Why? Because Gandalf's going to say, there's not fire hot enough in Middle Earth except for one place to really heat this up. Not even, he will say, and Caligon the Black, the progenitor of Smaug, Hobbit, would be able to heat this thing up. So, now Frodo sees the fiery script. Gandalf reads, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. Not a cheery... And he then reads the longer poem. And he says, this is it, Frodo. This is the one ring. This is the one ring Sauron lost and can't get back. Well, how on earth did it come to me, Frodo asks. Gandalf's like, well, that's a long story. Good thing we have time. So he talks about Sauron, the Dark Lord. He says, yeah, I know, you've heard that story. Hobbits have heard of, of like a shadow on the borders of old stories. Notice, that name is like a shadow on the border of old stories. Three little kind of things there. The shadow, the borders, the old stories are the things first, right? So where are the borders? They're kind of misty and in haze. The shadow is on the border of that. So what kind of old stories? Legend. Achilles. Odysseus. Agamemnon. Are those kinds of old stories. What kind of quote-unquote proof do we have for them? None. So he says, after a defeat and a respite, Shadow takes another shape and grows again. What does Gandalf not say there? Frodo, we have the possibility to rid the world of evil forever. No. Evil does what? It just takes another shape. Okay? Frodo, I wish it need not have happened in my time. Really? Who doesn't? And I usually at this point, you know, I bring in 9-11 and such. Imagine being George Bush. You're sitting there. You're in a, it's either kindergarten or first grade class, and you're reading, I don't know, Billy the Goat or something. And your chief of staff comes in and goes, uh, Mr. President, we're under attack right now. World Trade Center, planes flown into it. And you get this look in your eyes like deer in the headlights. I mean, if you've ever seen the picture, it is literal like deer in the headlights. And I imagine he's thinking, Right there. I wish it need not have happened in my time. Damn Bill Clinton. Why didn't it happen under his watch? Well, it did happen under his watch. February of 1993. The first attempt on the World Trade Center. Right? And I imagine Bill Clinton thought then, that damn George Bush, why didn't it happen under his watch? You know? Gandalf, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. In other words... Really? Duh. 
Does anybody really want to live in the worst times possible? But that's not for them to decide, Frodo. No. So Gandalf gives Frodo a little bit of advice. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. That's Gandalf's kind of oblique way of saying what? Or, as, oh, what's his name? The one guy on Flight 93, the one that went down in Pennsylvania, oh. said to the other men, let's roll. What did they do? They rose up and went after the hijackers. Why? Not on our watch are you going to fly this plane because they had been in contact, cell phones, with family members. They were told what's going on. They were told they think the plane you are on is headed towards D.C. to do what? Take One of two targets. Take out the White House. Take out the White House or the Capitol. Uh-uh. Not on our watch. Okay? That's what Gandalf is saying. Decide what you're going to do with the time you have. You can either sit and not do anything, in which case, whose problem does it become? Your children's, your children's children's. So do you want to pass this off to your children? Do you want it to be their problem, or do you want to solve, try to solve it now? Okay. He says the enemy likes one thing. If he gets this one thing, Frodo, all bets are off. He likes the ring. So he goes on and talks about the history of the rings. He talks about Gil-galad, the elven king. He talks about how Sauron had the ring cut off his finger. Finger cut off, too, by the way. Okay. How the ring fell into the Anduin, how it was found. We get the story of Smeagol and Diagol. Page 54. Gollum? Frodo cries. What? You mean the same Gollum that Bilbo met? You mean the Hobbit Gollum? How loathsome. Why how loathsome? Well, Gandalf has just kind of told us a story about Gollum, and Gollum sounds, sounds kind of like what? Hobbity like creatures. I think it is a sad story, says Gollum, says Gollum, says Gandalf, and it might have happened to others, even to some hobbits that I have known. Not so subtle um, slap down. Don't think so high of yourself. Like what other hobbits could it have happened? <laughs> so tired. Could it have happened to Bilbo. Bilbo? I can't believe that Gollum was connected with hobbits, however near distantly. What an abominable notion. Why not? Why do we want to believe? Hitler was crazy because of his syphilis. We don't want to believe that could happen to me. No, no, no. He, he, he had to have, something had to cause that. Or he was demon-possessed, as some people want to say. How do you explain? Not just Hitler. Mussolini. Stalin. Mao. And we could go on. Castro. Shea. You know, uh, crazy fat kid in North Korea. <laughs> Kim Jong-un, thank you. Sorry, that's what John McCain calls him. Crazy fat kid. I don't usually quote John McCain, but I, I like that one. I'm going to keep that one. Okay? All of them are responsible for what? Paul Pot. Millions, tens, hundreds of millions of deaths. I mean, it's estimated Stalin might personally, not personally going up to people and killing them, but because of his policies, might be responsible for the deaths of 60 million. Okay? That's a lot of people. That's roughly one-fifth of the United States. Take out California and Florida. Just Some people would say take them out anyways. Take the populations of those two states. Okay? He doesn't want to admit this because he doesn't want to admit this is even possible for Hobbits. Gandalf. 
It's true all the same. What's he mean? Think what you want. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you think about it. You know, 2 plus 2 is still going to equal 4. I don't care if you're taking new math or, you know. I won't even go into Common Core <laughs> education. So, Gandalf explains how the Frodo, how the Frodo came to the ring. How the ring <laughs> came to Frodo. Man. And he tells Frodo, page 55, when Frodo says what? You mean, if Gollum hated the ring, why didn't he get rid of it? You ought to begin to understand, Frodo, after all you've heard. He hated it, loved it, hated it as he loved himself. He couldn't get rid of it. He had no will. A ring of power looks after itself. That kind of implies what about a ring of power? Don't trust it if you can't see its brain. Okay, don't trust <laughs> it if you can't see its brain. What else? It has some kind of sentience. It has some, yeah, kind of will or volition. The ring left Gollum. Frodo, what, just in time to meet Bilbo? Wouldn't an orc have suited it better? Gandalf, no laughing matter, Frodo. And here's why. It's the strangest event in the whole story. There was more than one power at work. Okay. The ring was at work, right? Trying to get back to its master. It had slipped, and he tells us, slipped from Isildur so that Smeagol could catch it, etc., etc. Slipped from Smeagol so that Bilbo could find it. And he goes on and says, top of 56. Behind that, behind everything that happened, there was something else at work beyond any design of the ring maker. That is, Sauron's been sending out, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, telepathic vibes, whatever. Ring, come home. Ring, come home. Trying to reach out to the ring. But Gandalf says there's something at work behind Sauron. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker. Okay, so if Bilbo was meant to find the ring, what does that verb meant mean? What must be behind the mint? A meaner. The ER, Agent Who, means there's something else behind Sauron. Not making Sauron act like a puppet, but think of Sauron kind of like his fate. Well, there's something behind fate. And whatever it is that wanted Bilbo to have the ring, Gandalf says, in which case you also were meant to have it. And that might be an encouraging thought. Okay, put yourself in Frodo's shoes. Wait, you think that's encouraging that I have Satan's ring and Satan wants it back? <laughs> no, I don't really think so. It's not comforting. Because if the ring is what Gandalf says the ring is, then who wants it? Sauron. What's he going to do to get it? Whatever he has. Whatever it takes. Okay. Definite Slytherin, right? <laughs> See, teaching it this way opens up all new kinds of avenues for, avenues for me to chase those rabbits down and com completely off. So, Frodo says, and when did you discover that the ring was the ring? Gandalf's like, hello, just now, fire, lighting. He says, but I've also seen Gollum. What, you've seen Gollum? Yeah. And what happened after Bilbo escaped? Do you know? He says, well, not clearly, but I'm pretty sure he went down and he had a talk with Sauron. Was this a friendly talk? No, Sauron tortured him, and then he let him go, right? But what did Gollum do when he talked with Sauron? Two names. The Shire. Baggins. Because in The Hobbit, we hear, Baggins is, we hate it, we hate Baggins, Baggins, Baggins. Okay, and so he spread that up. Word around. So Gandalf says, so now Sauron is looking for the Shire and the name Baggins. He may be seeking for it now, page 59. Frodo. Great, smack dab in the middle of the page. But this is terrible. Far worse than 
the worst that I imagine from your hints and warnings. Oh, Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really, I was only mildly afraid before, but now, you know, Satan has my home address. Now I am really afraid. What am I to do? What a pity Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. What does he mean by pity there? Pity yeah, sucks to be me. <laughs> that Bilbo didn't kill when he had a chance. Okay, Major theme here. Throughout the novel. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy. What's the difference between pity and mercy? Mercy is benevolent. What do you mean, mercy is benevolent? Okay. What else? Pity. It shows that you care about them. You want something better for them. Okay. Pity is what as opposed to mercy? Pity is... You almost said it. It's a feeling. It's an emotion. What is mercy? It's an action. Mercy is action. Mercy is when you have someone in your control, okay, and you don't give them what they deserve. That's mercy, right? Mercy, I've done this on students' papers before, mercy is when the paper deserves an F. I mean, it's just, and it gets a D minus. And I'll usually put, this is mercy, you know. Don't count on it again, you know, kind of a thing. And I bring in Tolkienian, you know, you can test for, you know, all this kind of stuff. Read his essay, okay? Pity that stayed his hand. Why? Because if you go back and reread The Hobbit, what does Bilbo think when he looks at Gollum? Man, what a horrible life he must have. He's lived here a long time. He doesn't know how old Gollum is, but he sees Gollum, he hears Gollum, he talks to Gollum. Gollum wants to tell Riddles, why? Because he's not heard riddles in hundreds of years. And when Bilbo comes in, he's kind of like, you're kind of like me. You like, you like riddles? Riddles, God. <laughs> and they tell riddles. It's like a ray of sunshine, even though Gollum doesn't like the sunshine anymore. Okay? Pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy. What was the mercy? Not to strike without need. Did Gollum want to kill Bilbo? Yes, he did. Did Gollum talk about killing Bilbo? Yes, he did. He talked not only about killing Bilbo, but about eating him. That's... Okay, it's one thing to kill me, but don't consume me afterwards. You know, that's... And he has been well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure he took so little from the evil and escaped in the end because he began his ownership of the ring so with pity. Okay? This idea of no, go away. This idea of putting himself in Gollum's shoes. No, he doesn't. Okay, quit calling. Two calls in twenty seconds. Same number. Um, go away. Uh, Frodo, I am sorry, but I am frightened. And I do not feel any pity for Gollum. Well, at least he's honest. This is why he doesn't feel any pity. Why? He's scared. Okay. You have not seen him. Gandalf's telling us, yeah, well, Frodo, if you were to see him, I bet you would. No, and I don't want to. Why doesn't he want to? He doesn't want to feel pity for him. Look at what he says. I can't understand you. Do you mean to say that you and the elves have let him live on after all those horrible deeds? What is Frodo implying there about Gandalf and the elves and their relation to Gollum? Okay, possibly. What else? Yeah. That you have let him live. Like they've been placed in judgment over Gollum. Now, at any rate, he is as bad as an orc and just an enemy. 
he deserves death. Okay? Bad as an orc. What's an orc? It's a twisted elf. Orcs were made, Silmarillion, by Melkor slash Morgoth. Back in the time of the Silmarillion in the Elder Days. They were elves that Morgoth had captured and twisted and broke. Okay. Elves are good, noble beings. <laughs> you got a few exceptions. Feanor and his family. Okay. Melkor makes them into the opposite of what they're supposed to be. And then breeds these things. So breeds these twisted, deformed things so that when we get to this period, okay, orcs in Tolkien's cosmology have absolutely no good in them. They're not like Darth Vader. If you're familiar with the Star Wars oeuvre, what does Luke say? There is good in you, Father. I can feel it. I can sense the tension. Darth Vader doesn't say, you're wrong, kid. Psst, you know, zap him. What does he say? It's too late for me. He doesn't say you're wrong. By not denying, he's saying, you're right, there is still a little bit of good, but guess the evil outweighs the good, and uh, I'm screwed. Okay? Orcs, totally evil. Totally bad. You can go on a killing spree of orcs, and your conscience could be clear as a newborn baby. Nothing wrong at all with killing orcs. Okay? So that's the first thing. He is as bad as an orc and just an enemy. What does just mean there? Only. He can never be anything but an enemy. Well, what do you do with your enemies? You kill them, right? Except there's this itinerant preacher walking around ancient Palestine who happened to say what? You know, love your enemies. Do good to those who do evil to you, you know. Turn the other cheek. Yeah, look what happens to him. Yeah. Okay. Tolkien is Catholic. Tolkien is not merely nominal Catholic. He is a believing Catholic. He goes to Mass several times a week. He walks into Oxford from his home. I've been to a couple of his houses. I haven't knocked on the doors or anything, but I've been by and taken pictures. He walks into Oxford, and on his way in, he walks by the St. Aloysius Catholic Church at least two or three times a week and goes for early Mass. So, I mean, he really believes the whole Catholic faith, all right, which is important. Just an enemy. Kill him. He deserves death. Gandalf. Deserves it? You want to talk about it? You're right. He does. I dare say he does. I dare, dare say means kind of, I challenge anybody to tell me he doesn't. Notice Gandalf doesn't stop there, though. This is really important. I think this, I think a lot of this comes from Tolkien's experience in the war. Many that live deserve death. Shouldn't that be the other way around? Many that die deserve to live. Yeah, well, he's going to say that too. <laughs> Many that live deserve, deserve death. The book of Job in the Old Testament. One of the things that is raised in the book of Job is, or the book of Ecclesiastes. Why do rotten people live to ripe old ages and then die? Mobsters, for example. Fidel Castro. A rotten, sorry piece of work. Responsible for the deaths of thousands of people. He lived till he was, what, 88. Okay? While five-year-olds die of cancer. While people are on planes just thinking they're going to work, going to family, going to vacation, and they get flown into buildings. Okay? Many that live deserve death. A lot of, there are a lot of rotten people who shouldn't be sucking air. <coughs> yeah, that's one statement. And some that die deserve life. Notice he doesn't say many that die deserve life. He says some. What's Gandalf's point? 
A lot of people that are dead shouldn't ought to be dead. They don't deserve to die. Five-year-old with cancer. Captives on a plane flying into a building. Students at a high school. Students at Virginia Tech in 2007, just going to school, going about their daily business, doing what they think, thought they needed to do in order to have a successful, long life, and they never go home. Okay? So, three statements. Can you give it to them? Come on, Frodo, speak up. What's he saying? Can you give death to the living? No, that's pretty easy. Can you give life to the dead? What did Sirius say when Harry said, you know, Cedric Diggory popped out of Voldemort's wand. Diggory back from the dead? How does Dumbledore reply? Alas, there's no spell that can do that. Can you give life to those who are dead who deserve to be living. Then do not be too eager. Well, what happens between can you give it to them and then do not be too eager? I mean, Tolkien's writing this kind of dramatically. That's why I hate Peter Jackson. In one sense, you could say this thing is already written to be a great film. But Peter Jackson and Philip Aboyance, his wife, and the other person whose name I can't remember, they think they're better writers, and they're kindergartners with crayons compared to Tolkien, okay? Between, can you give it to them, and then do not be eager, I think Frodo's just kind of gone, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, didn't mean to step on your toes, I tell this is a touchy subject. Frodo gives some kind of visual cue that Gandalf takes to say, you're right, you can't. So don't be too eager to deal out death in judgment. Why? As has happened in the United States, we've come to understand over the last few years, way too frequently over about the last 30 or 40 years, you do capital punishment, it's capital. There's no oops. Sorry, I take it back after somebody has been executed. Wrongly. Is Tolkien bringing up the issue here of capital punishment? I don't think he is on the surface level. I think he might be down below. Okay? Because of saying, don't be too eager to deal out death in judgment. He doesn't say, don't deal out death in judgment. He says, don't be eager. Because what did Frodo say? How did Frodo begin? He deserved death. Why? Because I'm scared. That's why. Frodo thinks that other person should die. Why? Because I'm afraid of him. Talk about preemptive warfare. Okay. This is like saying, I'll use my crazy fat man analogy. Fat kid. This is like saying Kim Jong Un should be killed, assassinated by the CIA. Why? Because he might decide to launch a nuke. Might. Might isn't knowledge, right? It's not proof. It's kind of like, and I was a big proponent of it. Actually, was in the Wall Street Journal with one of my brothers-in-law. Okay, big proponent of the. Second Iraq War, the one after so-called weapons of mass destruction, that it turned out there weren't really any. I mean, yeah, there were some, but they were 20 and 30 years old and leaking and not very good. Okay? That was a preemptive attack. I think that's what Tolkien's kind of getting at here. Don't kill, then ask questions. Why? For even the very wise cannot see all ends. Now, ends there has those two meanings I've talked about before. Ends, finalities, like the end of a situation, 
What other meaning does it have? Purposes, exactly. The reason for something. What is he getting at? Purposes, reason, intentions. Gollum may still have purpose. Gollum may still have purpose. And whoever it was that meant for you, or whatever it was, that meant for you to have the ring, might have some kind of intention for Gollum. Are we ever told who that is? Does Tolkien ever use the words in this book, Eru Iluvatar, which is the name of the God being in the Silmarillion, the creator of everything? Nope. Doesn't even allude to it, other than we're going to see in the second most important chapter in the entire series of books, the Council of Elrond. Elrond is going to say something, and he's going to say, you know, some people call this fortune. Well, if you want to call it fortune, but he kind of goes, wink, wink, I know what it really is. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. Think about that statement. There is not, I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. What would be the natural Frodoian response to that? Yeah, create a new word. Mm -hmm. Two words. You'll get this probably at some point in one of the papers you write for me, one of the exam things. So what? Okay, so what if he's cured before he dies? Big freaking deal. Who cares? Well, Gandalf pretty clearly cares. Why? That is an important question. Why does Gandalf care whether or not Gollum is cured before he dies? Why does Dumbledore show concern about Morphin going to Azkaban for a crime he didn't commit. When we know Morphin did commit other crimes that probably merited going to Azkaban. Okay, so he goes to Azkaban, it's the wrong crime, big deal. That's where he belongs, right? As Frodo would say, he deserves death. Exactly. Gollum no longer has will in the matter. A mortal Frodo who possesses the ring will be possessed by it. Okay? So why does he want Gollum to find his cure before his death? <laughs> Thank you for using that word. He uses the word cure. Cure implies what? Gollum is ill. Gollum is merely sick. Gollum needs a healer. He needs to go off to the houses of healing that we're going to see in the next third volume. Okay. By doing this, Tolkien is bringing in, and you're going to think I'm crazy here, but I'm not. Um, Tolkien's bringing in religious language. He says in his letters, the Lord of the Rings is fundamentally a Catholic and philosophical work. Fundamentally. What does fundamentally mean? At its core. At its nature. core. At its foundation. It is Catholic and philosophical. He says, he goes on, much more so in the revising than in the creation. In other words, he didn't sit down one morning and go, hmm, I need a, a follow-up of the Hobbit. Let's see, what can you see, but it needs to be fundamentally Catholic. So how do I write a really long tale that will hold people's attention, amuse them, excite them, blah, blah, blah. It has Jesus and Mary in the Catholic Church in it somehow. But it doesn't have Jesus and Mary in the Catholic Church in it in any way. 
There are no quote unquote references to Christianity at all. The world of the Lord of the Rings is a pagan world. Pagan, pagan. Yeah, kind of. You have to you gotta be careful with the use of the term magic. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Right? So how can it be fundamentally Catholic? How can it be Catholic without having Catholicism? The ideas. Tolkien says in his fairy story essay, you know how a story means something? It's not merely what the characters say. It's the overall atmosphere and tone. What is one of the overall... I'll use the question I use for my course I teach in London. What is the appeal of Harry Potter? Is it the magic? Is it the wand waving? Is it when Guardian Leviosa said, ooh, look at the feather? Is it that? Is it the values? Is it the journey? Is it the hero of a thousand faces who goes on, you know, the monomyth kind of thing of Joseph Campbell? Depends on the reader to some extent. Okay. I argue in my classes and a couple of uh, lectures and interviews I've done, it's some of that, but then it's even deeper than that. It gives two things, really. One, it awakens a sense of wonder. Okay. And two, it provides meaning. Meaning to a world that seems meaningless. Our world seems completely meaningless. Like everything is going helter-skelter, out of control, especially after 9-11. I, I did a telephone interview with a writer for the New York Times after 9-11. Why? Because I was editing a journal devoted to fantasy literature at the time. And their editor found me, the reason the editor, contact, editor contacted me, because two films came out in the fall of 2001. Ring, and we got some... Harry Potter. And they both have something unique about them. They're kind of set in the Middle Ages. They have a medieval aspect. And I kind of correct her and said, no, they're not set in the Middle Ages. One, because this predates the Middle Ages by thousands of years. Just because it doesn't have technology doesn't mean it's medieval. Game of Thrones is not medieval. Why? Because it's not set in our world. In order to be medieval, it has to be in our world set between the ancient world and our world. That's what medieval means. Okay? Harry Potter, for what I would call adept readers, and I don't mean you have to be 56 years old and have read it, you know, 30 times or so, uber nerd, but for readers who pay attention to what's going on, what does it do? It kind of tells you there is a meaning to life. That's the message Harry at least receives. Because what happens to him that morning after his wand is destroyed? He's destroyed, right? He doesn't think there's any meaning in life. He thinks the universe thinks, I don't give a rat's you know what for you, Harry. That's when he reaches bottom. And then what happens? The silver doe, the sword, destroying horcruxes. And what is reawakened in Harry that we first get introduced to in book five? We get introduced to it by Luna. Harry talks with Luna after he talks with Nearly Headless Nick, remember? Nearly Headless Nick says, he will have moved on. He ain't coming back. Harry's like, shit. And then he talks to Luna, and she goes, come on, Harry. You heard him? You heard the voices? And it's not like we won't ever, you won't ever see him again. Here's like, what? She gives him an element of faith there. And when you get towards the latter end of the Deathly Hallows, what happens? That element of faith that is spurred by the arrival of the Silver Doe, starts to do what? 
it starts to blossom and grow. That what once had been a flame in Harry's chest that is chilled because of the conversation of Muriel and Rita Skeeter, that spark is reborn. And it grows and grows and grows and grows. And what do we see? Harry finally chooses to do what? I use that chooses to do because we're told earlier in the novel how, how could Doge expect me to choose what to believe? I have to know. We get to the end, and what does Harry choose? He chooses to believe Dumbledore. He chooses to follow. He chooses Horcruxes, not Hallows. That's the knowledge that comes to him while he's digging Dobby's grave. Because what else does he see while he's digging Dobby's grave? Voldemort, what? Starts making his way to Hogwarts. What's he going to Hogwarts for? Say hello to get the Elder Wand. What does Harry choose? To stay put. Why? I'm not meant. I've got to get the Horcruxes. Gandalf says, I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured, but he wants him to be cured. He wants him to be healed. What do you do when you cure meat? No? Preserves it. What's another word for preserve? You're saving it for later. Notice, Tolkien's using that idea without using the overtly religious language. Of saving or of salvation. This right here is a fundamentally Catholic and philosophical notion. So why does he want Gollum cured? We don't know. He never actually tells us. Unless it is because of something Gollum is going to tell us, and let us, unless it is to lead us to something Gollum is going to tell us just before his death. Okay? Which I won't answer yet. So, he says, oh, and one other ring. One other reason. I think he's bound up with the fate of the ring, Frodo. You kill him now, guess what? You take the bound up with the fate of the ring thing out of the picture. For good or ill... He has some part yet to play. Well, what is that? You know, bite the finger off and... Ah. So, they continue talking. Frodo pulls the ring out of his pocket, looks at it. And he says, well, so what can we do? How do we destroy it? And he says, well, you know, your fire won't do anything. Not even a Caligon the Black could have done anything. There's only one way, top of 61. Find the cracks of doom in the depths of Oradruin and throw the ring in there. Okay, so again, three components. Find the cracks of doom in Oradruin and throw the ring in. So where do you have to go first? Mordor. Where's Oradruin? You've got maps in your book. Find it. It's like Mordor is like, uh, let's see, from your perspective, mountains are like this, looks like a giant E kind of. Oradruin's way down here. Barad-dur, the Tower of Sauron, is way up here. So you got to get way into the kingdom, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, though, yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil kind of a thing. So you got to, first of all, you got to get there. If this were the United States, is like the United States, and you're talking about coming from the West Coast or the East Coast, where are we talking? Uh... Missouri, you got to come way in, okay? And then you have to find on the mountain the cracks of doom. In other words, it's not, oh, look, there's a crack. I see some lava way down there. Let's just try it here. No, nah, you got to find the exact spot, what? Where it was forged. And then what's the third thing you have to do? So the first one's hard. The second part's harder. And the third one... It's impossible. You've got to willingly give it up. Frodo, I do really wish to destroy it. 
Notice that sentence. It's very active. The subject is strongly performing the action of the verb. I really wish to destroy it. Really wish, emphasizing how he wants to destroy it. And then Frodo kind of catches himself. Oh, or well, to have it destroyed goes from very active voice to very passive voice. To have it destroyed means what? Yeah, somebody else do it. Here, bring Sam in from outside. Let's give it to Sam to do. Why? Because I am not made for perilous quests. Well, who is? <laughs> who is made? I mean, who is made for perilous quests? Was Abraham Lincoln made to be the president when the country went all haywire? No. George Bush definitely wasn't made for 9-11. Though, some people have said, and I kind of think, you know, he did a pretty good job with it. He messed up some things. You know, FDR was not made for World War II. Part of me thinks Winston Churchill, yeah, he was made. You know, everything in his background led him to, for that one point. Okay. I wish I'd never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? All that means what? Why me? Okay, meaner. <laughs> Behind the mint to have the ring. Why me? I can't help but think George Bush, 9-11, why me? Why did this happen in my time, not somebody else's? Gandalf, such questions cannot be answered. Next. What's Tolkien doing there? Don't be silly. Why? Because we can all do what with those kinds of questions? We can sit there and look in the mirror of Erised and kind of, you know, Try to figure it all out and never do anything. What must be done? Something. S something. Right? Well, there's a little bit more answer. It wasn't given to you, Frodo, because of any merit others don't possess. In other words, you weren't given it because you are Frodo the Almighty. What is Frodo? He's a midget. It's not, we're not talking, you know, Schwarzenegger reduced. We're not, you know, bulging. He's a midget, essentially. Okay? What else does Gandalf say? Not for power or wisdom at any rate. Slam. Not because of your great strength, and it's not because of your wisdom. But you have been chosen. There is that meaner. Somebody chose you, and you must do what? Use such strength and heart and wits as you have. Why? Because everybody has those. You must use such strength as you have, even if you're a quote-unquote 90-pound winkly. You use the 90 pounds of strength you have. You must use whatever heart. What does he mean by heart? Whatever measure of courage you have wits that's intellect this 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 is Harry before they go through the trap door I, I can't do any of this stuff and Hermione says after they do go all the way through and they're standing there at the potion she says oh Harry you have any you know you're the smart he goes oh Harry there is what courage and friendship and loyalty and you have all these things you know in spades I don't have any of these. Gandalf. Uh, Frodo. You are wise and powerful. Will you not take the ring? What is that? That's the ring going, Take me, Gandalf. <laughs> because if Gandalf takes the ring, what happens? I will contest the Dark Lord and... No. Why doesn't he take it? With that power, I should have power too great and terrible. There's the renunciation of power. I mean, that's it. And over me, the ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. 
do not tempt me. I do not wish to become like the Dark Lord himself. This is, this is what? This is Dumbledore not becoming Minister of Magic. Not once, not twice, three times. Boy, this really does open up new synapses firing. The way of the ring to my heart is by pity. Pity for weakness and the desire of strength to do good. Remember the letter to Gellert Grindelwald. Why must we take power? For the greater good. Okay. Tolkien's not unaware of the charms, the seductions of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism. Doing the greatest good for the greatest number. Notice what Gandalf says. He could do with the ring. I could do good. But for how long? We're going to see a conversation later on in the Council of Elrond where Gandalf has a conversation with Saruman. And Saruman's going to say, Gandalf, you know, we should take the ring together. And he's going to show pretty clearly, he, Tolkien's going to show pretty clearly why that can't happen. Okay, so we're going to, six minutes we have. Skip a bunch. Sam? Yes. Uh, well, we're going to be on. Sorry. Sam gets caught at the end of that chapter, and Gandalf says, you're going with Frodo. Okay? Three is company. What's the, what's the three? Who's the three? Sam? Frodo? Um, well, Mary's... Um, yeah, Mary went ahead. So it's Sam, Frodo, and Pippin. Okay? They make their way. Why? Frodo's moving. He's leaving the Shire. He's going off to Crick Hollow, Buckleberry, etc. Because he's. Why is he leaving the Shire? They know where he is. It. He's staying in the Shire. What's he trying to do? He says he wants to save the Shire. You go to. At the Grey Havens. The end of the novel, he tells Sam, I wanted to save the Shire, Sam, and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so, Sam. That is, the world's been saved, but not for me. Okay, so three's company, they go off. We're going to skip a whole bunch. Um, they go off into the old forest, captured by old man Willow. Nasty old mean willow tree and rescued by Tom Bombo. Huh? <laughs> you don't have time for this. Page 131. Told you, skip a lot. Okay. Rescued by Tom Bombadil, they're in his house, and Tom Bombadil's telling them about the past and everything, and it's kind of like days flow into weeks and and Frodo finally asks, Who are you, Master? Now, Tom Bombadil often gets completely left out of discussions. Why? Because he doesn't figure any more into the story after these chapters. Well, that's because he doesn't belong. See, Tolkien had written, before he published this, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil is not a Middle-earth creature. He exists in his own little, and Tolkien just kind of gets to this point and goes, huh, and drops Tom Bombadil in. Okay? Okay. Who are you, Master? Tom. Eh? What? Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Whoosh. They're hobbits. They should like riddles. Tell me, who are you alone, yourself, and nameless? Yeah, think about that for a minute. Who are you alone, yourself, and nameless? Where do we get our names from? Parents. So how can you be nameless? Does that mean your parents don't know what to call you and they just call you a kid, you know, for a couple of days and then they get named? No. He's talking about what am I? Alone. Yourself. That is not what others think or say. And nameless. Self? No. I think Tom is telling us something here. I think Tom is telling us, and I could be completely wrong, that he is a manifestation of Iru Iluvatar. He is an epiphany of God. Why? Because he's going to say, I'm, I'm old. You're young, I'm old. How old am I? I'm eldest. 
How eldest? They're going to meet Treebeard later on. Treebeard says, I'm the oldest. And then Treebeard's going to go, oh yeah, I forgot about Tom. Well, how old is Tom? Tom says, I was here and knew the dark stars when it was fearless, before the dark lord from, came from outside. Who was the dark lord who came from outside? Not Sauron. Morgoth. Silmarillion. When did he come? Just real quick after the beginning of time. Yeah, after the music of the Ainur. Morgoth came from outside. That is, Morgoth left the presence of Uru and Luvatar and entered, entered the world the Ainur created through their songs and stuff. So how could Tom Bombadil have been there? He's not one of the Ainur that is named, at least, and nobody went before Morgoth. So how is he already here? Uh, unless he is some kind of manifestation of Eru Iluvatar. Tolkien says in one of his letters, Tom is a spirit of pacifism. Because he won't have anything to do with it. Okay, that's all fine and good. But with this description, I think there's only one other thing Tom could be. That Tom was always there. Tom was kind of the creative principle that gave being to the songs sung by the Ainur, because the, the Ainur sing this song in the summary, and in a rule of Tar finally goes, okay, stop. Now let me show you what you just did, because you thought you were just singing. Uh-uh. You were making. Let me show you what you made. And I think Tom could be the making aspect. Okay? And we got to stop there, because it's 11, 12.45. So we're going to pick up Real briefly, Fog on the Barrow Downs. Um, whatever day that is, Tuesday. And you've got to 